Hello guys, hope James here, hope you're doing well, hope you're having a good holiday and hope you're staying cool when it's sweltering, sweltering below it's humid, humidity temp temperatures anyway, um, I'm going to give you a couple videos um, one's going to start with is another issue centered around not only in America is dealing with dealing with the issue about race but our northern northern neighbors to the north Canada is is having the same kind of issue but I'm going to pay this video and I, I'll get back with you amid global market volatility stock market losses and rising inflation mm -hmm. have left investors with It's your girl Emma from EA Public Relations. Welcome to another episode of Free Falling in Niagara. I'm going to talk to you about racism in the workplace. We have some sisters that are going to share their experiences working in the public sector, and they've been in these jobs for decades some for 20 years, some for over 20 years, and they've been overlooked time and time again. A white person was given the job over them, and they're still in the same entry level position that they came in with. They also are going to share some of the racial um, situations that they suffered. So I'm going to play the clip and then we'll talk about it. This practice of excluding black employees, of, of almost dehumanizing us, it has to stop. It's been four months since Marcia Banfield Smith left her job at the Department of Justice. But she says the scars from her time there run deep. I'm almost afraid to do anything else because I think if I make a mistake, because people make mistakes, it's inevitable. Will I then, or will they say this is why they never took her on at the Department of Justice? Banfield Smith says she watched as non-black colleagues rose through the ranks while she was kept at the same job and same pay for 19 years. No, I came in in 2002 as, as a paralegal. I went to school. I became a lawyer. I had all these extra credentials, all this extra experience, and I never once, never once received a promotion. Anytime I tried to bring up anything, I was told, you're too sensitive. I still have to listen to racist jokes at team meetings. I still have to watch individuals who are not black just leap above me to other opportunities that I should be awarded. It's a familiar story for Michelle Herbert, who still works for Service Canada. She claims anti-black discrimination has kept her at the same job for seven years and says she's now on leave because of the toll it's taken on her. The impact is devastating. My self-esteem has been eroded. Having to go into a workplace where I know I'm strategically being excluded from opportunities is um, debilitating, it's paralyzing. It causes me to doubt myself. It causes me to doubt my capability. Both women are now part of a proposed class action lawsuit of black civil servants, which has more than 1,000 plaintiffs. They filed a motion to have the suit certified. In a statement, the Treasury Board of Canada Secretariat, the employer of the Federal Public Service, said, the court has not yet set a timetable for the remaining steps toward a certification motion, including a date. It added, at this stage, it would be premature to comment on how the next steps will unfold. Nobody wants to go to trial. Nobody wants to do any of this. But we can't be treated like this anymore. This is enough. Enough is enough. And because I have the opportunity to come forward, I come forward. At first it was okay, but then it became a living nightmare. That's how Carol Sipp describes the 26 years she worked as a public servant. During that time, she says she endured harassment and discrimination from a supervisor. Treatment that she says took a toll on her both mentally and physically. If there's a project and you have to lift boxes and only black, black ladies were on lifting those boxes and I complained to management, they did nothing about it. I went to the EAP officer for advice. I wrote to my member of parliament. I went to the union also, but nothing was done really. SIP is part of a proposed class action lawsuit against the government alleging decades of discrimination. It's very important to me because I look at the young children growing up and I don't want them to go through what I personally went through or, or the others have gone through. It's not fair. We are all human.
one, whether we black, white, or whatever color, wherever we come from. So as I said, um, this is what they've been facing. And to the point now where we are at the point where we're having a class action lawsuit. And we got over a thousand votes. A thousand people are interested in being involved in this lawsuit. So if there are a thousand people who are talking about experiencing this, you could imagine that there's more than a thousand people. I truly hope that they're successful in this lawsuit because this cannot go on any longer. We deserve the same rights as everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. I look forward to your likes, comments, subscriptions, and just keep following us. Lastly, I'm gonna talk about this t-shirt I'm wearing. This is again from the Carl Parks collection owned by myself and my partner. Uh, we use the word black, and we're describing what we as black people are. We're bold, we're loving, we're courageous, we're kind. We're all of those things, and we would like for everybody to recognize us as the same people that everybody else is in this world. Thank you again. Follow me on my Instagram, Emma, E-M-M-A-A, -M -M -A, underscore Ansa, A-N-S-A-H. You can get me on my YouTube channel, EA Public Relations, and on Facebook, Emma Ansa. I look forward to seeing and speaking with you. Until then, peace be. I'm honored to be featured in Construction Dive on racism in the construction industry. The construction industry is an amazing industry, amazing people. One of the first industries that I entered into after my career as a professional first responder when I went into business. So I have amazing relationships in construction. Love the people. It is the industry that builds America. Our roads, our bridges, our houses, you name it. Construction does it and just a wonderful group of people. In this article, we talked about racism and we talked about the elephant in the room that people are afraid to address. It's a hot topic item and it's one of those items that if you are a leader, you have to address today because no longer can you stay silent and let these things just happen. So one of the things I talked about with the reporter who created this amazing series of different people that he interviewed, we talked for about two hours and I shared with one, what's the deal on racism? Why are we seeing so much today? It always existed, okay? It was just covered up. It wasn't something brought to the forefront. Understand with media, understand with news how it works, that there are certain points, talking points they call them, certain buzz words that are the thing of the time. If you wonder why like this year is a year of racism and systemic racism talk, it's talking point for 2020, okay? It's been around for years in America. We had Abraham Lincoln, then we still had kids with the busing segregation, and we've had different things in corporate settings where people are excluded from jobs, they're not paid high enough, they're rejected because they have a misdemeanor or a felony or different things like that, when they were born into an environment that was very challenging in the first place where perhaps they had post-traumatic stress years and years ago as a result of having to have a gun on themselves at 14, 15 years old. These are the things that I saw as a paramedic in urban environments. I saw the challenges that our current public policy and lack thereof creates for these people and then lands them into jail or lands them into different situations. So. Racism is a challenging thing because it's always been there. It's always been there. It's been in the shadow. It's been at the forefront and it's been covered up in a lot of ways because we're a country that is this melting pot and this melting pot is the land of rhetoric. It's the land that the American dream, anybody can have it. You can work hard, you can achieve, you can do all these different things. We are the kings of rhetoric in the world. And unfortunately when rhetoric gets smashed, then you have reality. So reality is the world that I live in. Rhetoric is the world that a lot of people choose to live in because it paints the rosier picture. The reality is the world of leadership. It's the place where we come to drive change. So these issues have been going on. They've been going on for quite some time. And now there's a story about it, talking about it publicly, openly, and bringing good people together for different perspectives on how to address this elephant in the room to have safe cultures. So let's talk about why you should not tolerate racism in the construction industry or any industry for that matter. One, there should be a zero tolerance policy. You just don't 
tolerated. If somebody is being racist, they're being disrespectful, or this is viewed as a legitimate hate crime, there needs to be zero tolerance. So now let's talk about why racism is a bad deal for your business and what you need to do. One, racism, zero tolerance today. Just do not tolerate it. If you have employees who are racist, who are having issues, you can talk to them, you can counsel them. If it's not at that level where it's already perceived as a hate crime, it's directed towards somebody, you can talk with them and try to coach them through thinking about why they believe what they believe, why they're being that way to somebody, and is this really the highest version of themselves? Is this really who you want to be? And making it clear that if you continue this way, I have to fire you. There's no other choice. This is not a culture that we condone racism. It's not even an option for us to go there. So think about some of the words that you just said to somebody. Think about some of the things, whatever. It's a zero tolerance policy. If I hear this again, you will be fired. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And the desire to change has to come from you. No amount of programming can change people's hearts, can change their heart and mind. Exactly. Now, programming, when we talk about should people have to take anti-bias training and different things like that, it's a very challenging topic. It's a very challenging conversation right now. One is, yes, people should be required to take personal and professional development training. When we're talking about racism, we're talking more about changing the person than we are talking about changing the profession. People who are racist are racist for numerous reasons. They are racist because we live in a society that promotes the white male race more than other races out there. We are also living in a society where, let's just be pragmatic about this for a second, depending on the research and statistics, 60 to 70% of Americans are white. So then you have a large percentage. Now contrast that in your mind for a second, be open with me, to think about Asia. If you are in a country like Vietnam, most of the people are Vietnamese. So when you're walking around Vietnam, you see more people who are Vietnamese. Well, is there racism? Is there this and that going on? It's about perspective. So understand that America is a white country by default, by the people who came here, who had children here, who procreated, who had the next generation here and all of that and through immigration we've had more and more people coming in to America creating this melting pot. Now what that means is this, inherently people will have different perceptions. They will favor perhaps somebody who looks more like them than the other person. We know this in sales, people buy from people they know, like and trust and who also resemble some of the same values, behaviors and attributes as themselves. It's human psychology, psychology 101. So that makes it challenging when you say, let's put these programs in place, let's tell everybody that they're being racist and let's change the world all of a sudden tomorrow. It doesn't work that way and that's a good way to actually alienate people. So you have to be strategic in who you're bringing in to teach a program. You have to make sure that that person does not have an agenda because there are also a lot of people out there using this program right now through the government, through different you know, requirements of having anti-bias training to promote specific agendas. So you have to be careful with that because promoting specific agendas as we have a lot of special interest groups and a lot of lobbying in America does not mean it's always the best or most holistic information. So should you have training on anti-bias, anti-racism, all these things, just like other things, yeah, it doesn't hurt. Why would you not do this? And why would you not create a culture where you can talk about challenging situations, whether it's racism, whether it's age discrimination, whether it's gender, whether it is whatever, Let's not be this country that we have to polarize everything, where we can't talk about this, we can't talk about that. Let's be the country that is a grown up country that we can talk about things. That your feelings don't get hurt all of a sudden. Go out on a tweet because I said something about you or you said something about me and now we have a million trolls trolling around. That doesn't do good for anybody. It doesn't grow anybody, it doesn't develop anybody. It's just the way we're living in right now in our tech world where everything is so polarized in a click of a button 
you can make a lot of drama that just does not need to be there. So, should you do training? Yes, do training. Consider this a key piece of your cultural awareness, your cultural sensitivity training, your best practices, your best workplace training. Now, make sure you have a good trainer or a good speaker who comes in who can talk about this in a holistic way and who does not alienate people because I have been through some of these training programs and some of these training programs are very alienating. I'm extremely open-minded. I've been around the world. I have friends from all different groups and some of these programs are truly alienating and are very judgmental. So make sure you vet the person, ask them how they view racism, ask them about their own cultural awareness, their own understanding, what experiences they've had outside of America in different cultures and different countries because that's very important. We're living in a multicultural, multi-generational workforce right now where we have people from all over the world that are working with us from all different genders, all different ages, all different backgrounds. We truly have now more people of different backgrounds together. So making sure that this is just not one specific race being the anti-racism agenda training program, and that it's truly an inclusive, how do we get along as humans, as humans here in America with different backgrounds, different beliefs, different religions, different upbringings, different, 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 how do we get along as human? Next, I wanna talk about what you can do on a job site or in your office environment. Do an audit. When you look around at people and they are going around and having lunch, do they sit by themselves the whole time? Do all of the Latinos hang out in the one group with all the Latinos and then the black workers are there and the white workers are over there and nobody's eating lunch together? Well, you have a problem. Understand that you can create connection, you can create community, you can create different tabletop exercises, you can have lunches on the job site. You can bring people together through food. That's what Anthony Bourdain did. He traveled the world, different communities, different cultures, different foods, and he brought people together through food. I love doing this. I'm a big fan of lunch meetings. I do it all the time. And food brings us together. It's where we drop our guard. It's what I learned in the fire department. You could be working with people that you really don't care for in one fire station, but come lunchtime, you're all best friends. You all get along. You all drop the guard. You all drop, just, you, you just you let the shit go. Food, I'm telling you, it changes people's lives. And food's damn good. So. Do your audit around the lunchtime, around times when people could be hanging out, and if they're not, how do you encourage them to share? A way to do this through food is having a potluck. Having somebody come in and say, this is my chicken from my family, this is my salad from my family, this is my barbecue recipe from my family, this is my pasta as an Italian from my family, you name it. Food can teach people, it can break down things. Talk about the region where it's from. Talk about the things that went into the food, the different spices, the recipes, all these different things like that. Who touches the food? Think about your supply chain. Who actually made the spices? Where did the spice come from? Maybe India, maybe this. Talk about Indian culture. You get the point. You're facilitating a conversation to talk about things, to open people's minds, to open their hearts, and to start changing their perspective. Or they want to get curious and come to a video like this, or they want to go to a magazine and start reading and go, wow, I didn't think that the world was like that. Oh, wow, I haven't left the U.S. Maybe it's time for me to get out of here for a month and go travel. As a facilitative leader, you're planting the seed for growth. I want you to say that I'm planting the seed for growth for your people. It's very important. And lastly, racism. It's horrible for your bottom line. Okay, It's horrible for your bottom line. Here's why. Injuries happen, accidents happen, communication just stops. Communication is essential. It's critical to any good business out there today. Communication keeps your business going, it keeps things flowing, and it also creates a safe work environment. If people don't feel that they can trust you, or the management team, or somebody else, because there's a perceived sense of racism, you stay on the risk for injuries, accidents, and even death. So. Be mindful in your communication and how people feel. Can they open up? Remember, communication is a two-way street. You can put out bulletins all day long. You can put out, don't say this, don't do that, we'll fire you, we'll do this, we'll do that. Did you create an exchange? Did you even go with the basic principle of communication that understands that when you send something out, somebody has to receive it in their mind, they have to process it in the brain, and then they have to be able to come back and tell you, 
yeah, I understand this, or this is how I feel about this. If you're not there with your culture, hire me as a consultant, bring me in, let's talk about that because it's so important because you have to get to that level where you're talking about these tough things. And if you don't, have fun being on the five o'clock news. Don't be there, don't be that business. A lot of these things can change. Understand it's complex, understand we're living in a very polarized time, but that these issues have been going on. We are creating segregation now with the wealth gap. We're creating segregation as well with the high-speed rail. Quite frankly, that train system will be designed so wealthy people, largely foreign investors, can live in San Francisco and the service class can live in Fresno and that train will be built for that purpose because that's the reality from an economic standpoint, from a system standpoint. So that project is in a sense what the busing segregation was years ago. It just looks a little bit better, it looks cleaner, it's more politically correct, but we're doing the same thing. We don't learn, people just don't learn. They keep doing the same stupid stuff over and over again. So don't be that company, don't be complicit in that. Really start thinking about the projects you're building, the people that are building them, and how you can have the best company culture out there today. I have confidence that you can do it, and if you learn something, share a comment, let me know what you learned, and get out there, go make the best culture you can, because people are truly amazing. When they feel loved, when they feel nurtured, when they feel safe, you have outstanding results, you have outstanding ideas, and you have outstanding projects that can truly make the country innovative in a country where people go, wow, this is America. This is the place that I want to call home and that I'm proud to call home. At Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, we believe Yeah, the guy's right. And um, I'm proud that he mentions the I'm glad that he mentions mentioned the solution. And and that's this should, this this video should go to Canada and America. That this this has been our been a problem. And he's right how it divides people up. That's one of the, one of the reasons why I think I'm, you know, I didn't go back. One of the reasons why I'm almost trying to think I know I didn't go back to the workplace right away because I've, I've encountered something similar to that. And it wasn't direct, but it was intentional in ways. And... And it was from a few individuals. It wasn't from everybody in the workplace. Let me state by that. And in fact, you know, some of the people I work with, it was on the third shift. We got along, but when when the, but when you got come to the first shift, people, you got somebody that got to micromanage you and just feel like they got to be over you, and it's really causing a division with people. It really has. It has really. It's not a good thing um, for people to have this mindset to be over people like that or to treat people wrong and disrespect people. And regardless of who doing it to who, whether it's a black person, a white person, any other person doing that to somebody, that's just, it's just so, it's wrong, man. I mean, you just, um, it's just the wrong thing to do. And it really divides us up. And as a country, as a nation, and there's it's no sol there's no solution to it, and, and it's not going to be well received. And my motto is um, is is do for your own. And my, much and it seems like we're going back to segregation ways. I have seen it not only workplace, I've seen it in church. I've been at churches where. Like I was telling, telling, mentioning years, a year or two prior that I went to, God commissioned me to go to a Latino church. And it's, it's something that he mentioned about that, that, you know, you figured that the food situation, because to learn about the culture, to learn about, learn about things, but sometimes it seemed like, you know, I put my four best to try to break down that wall, but you have some Latinos and Hispanics don't want to break down the wall. They want to be, they want, so they want to be like that. And it's the same way, and, and it's some black sort, and, and, and fair enough, there are black people the same way when it comes to other people. And you have Asians and 
unfortunately, you're gonna have people like that 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 just stuck with their own, stick with their own, stuck with their own. You know, and I think it's I think it's on an individual basis. I don't think it's the whole group of people, but you got people that just, you know, they keep themselves divided up. And uh, and here, here's another video. Um, that he talked.
they'll, they'll walk up to the door and say, hey, I'm part of the family till somebody Caucasian walks in. I was like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Look. But the thing is, the so-called South Asian, they have shown the natural ass. They've been showing it for years. But the last 10 years, they ain't got really cocky ass. Now, mind you, the black community has supported all these different people. The civil rights movement, which we led, which we died, which we bled, which we was abused physically, mentally, and socially. We did all this. And other people come in and benefit from it and turn around and give us a little thing. Now, granted, this ain't nothing new. But the, 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 the so called South Asian has really been very blatant with it. Very more blatant. I mean, let me tell you something. We've seen people of Arab descent. We've seen other Asians. We've seen people from the Jewish community. We've seen people from the Latino community. We've seen people in the gay community. They've all done it at some point. But the so called South Asians, they have been particularly involved by it. And in the next one, the other day, Vivek Rashad was on the Breakfast Club. Now, y'all know how I feel about the Breakfast Club. But this time, I never thought I would say this. I probably regret saying this. The Breakfast Club held his feet to the fire. Charlemagne the God. Usually I say Charlemagne the Cobra, but it's giving me respect today. DJ M and the sister, I'm feeling name, who's a uh, 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 Air Force veteran, and she called him out. And he found out that his father did not start voting. He did not, he's 37 years old. He did not vote for the first time until 2020. Think about that for a second. He's 37 years old. You do the math. Damn. That means it's sick. Last year, he's 36. That's 2022. Year before that, he was 35, 2021. Year before that, he was 34 years old. And yet, he's going to tell us and try to lecture us about being American, being patriot, and talk about service and shit. My father, my uncles, my cousins, my former classmates, former employees, employers, myself, have served or continue to serve in this capacity, military or law enforcement. My brother, law enforcement. Barbara Tucker was the youngest of seven siblings. She was thought of as the big. Let me, let me, let me, let me point, let me point this out. This dude sits back and passed judge, and then they asked about her back. It was a racist policy. How can you, your daddy and mama come over here, benefit from it? You benefited and say it's a racist policy. But I digress. Every time you turn around, these fuckers are saying something nasty. Now, don't get me wrong, I got criticism all the way across. But I've been telling y'all the last few months, these South Asians, they have really given the black community the blues. If I ain't gonna lie, if I can go to time machine, go back in time, as a kid, when they can't stop in the neighborhood, in these stores, I don't like fucking that. I don't want to get that bad. I wait till we go to Jewel. Or wait till y'all go to 7-Eleven or, or someplace else. These fuckers got gas stations in our neighborhoods. They got Dunkin' Donuts everywhere. And, and the thing is, is that these fuckers don't live among us. They want to live among white folks. And then the same white folks they live around can't stand them. They make fun to their face. They get bites to them. But what do they do? They don't, they don't get mad at them. They drink all that and get right back to us. Now, I'm not saying every white person do that. I just find it funny how they talk about us and dismiss them of us. We've been here for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. They just got here within the last, what, 60 years in that? Nikki Haley, but all of them, the Nikki Sue, the all of them, they all got something smart to say and tell us that our issues don't exist. They don't mean anything. Well, I came across the video, and like I said, I, some of these people, I'm glad that you, I, I look at YouTube as a plus and minus. But I, every now and then I come across videos from other YouTubers. Well, I sub to them or not, I'm interested to see they change. So I came across the video of, of, of this uh, sister right here. And I don't know where she's from, but she has an accent. I don't know 
world she what part of the world she's from. But she obviously I know another sister that put these TikTok videos where people get caught saying things and shit. This Indian American man is mad because this white woman was talking about the issues of discrimination and using black people. She talked about other groups, but she was basically saying that nobody has gone through the crap globally that we have gone through, continue to go through. And this dude got mad that you only here. And I think it's high time that black Americans. Look, I, I, I didn't call out my brothers and sisters from the island. I didn't call out brothers and sisters across the flood. I called out our brothers and sisters from the motherland. But I think it's high time to stop calling out these opportunities. Remember, I told y'all we're a country of thieves, slaves, and opportunities. It don't take much to figure out who slaves were and the thieves were. These motherfuckers was complaining about our face. They, they want to destroy us. They want us to be beneath them. And they figured if we join fortunes of white supremacists, we'd be accepted. But will these bastards know that white supremacists are going to say, you know what? Y'all think y'all Y'all doing our dirty, y'all dirty work for us. They think they're going to be seen as white or be accepted. Because some of them want to be, they don't really want to put their ethnicity on applications. They want to be classified as Caucasian. Now, I try not to be a fuck thick violent thoughts, but I'm a human being. Sometimes I think nasty, dirty thoughts as well. I try to push them out of my head. But when I hear motherfuckers like this talk about us, I ain't gonna lie, want to put my foot in their hands. Because they are where they at based off with my grandparents, my parents, even myself, my siblings, cousins, and friends, acquaintances, and people I don't know what we've done for years. This is why I say we as black Americans have to learn how to control my doubt. We need to know how to decipher who's our allies or not. We got to learn how to disagree with each other. Because we got too many enemies running around. But this bastard's man, because this white woman called his ass out and just basically checked his ass. And let me see if I can find a section where she basically she cursed his ass out. She checked his ass. This is fair usage. I want y'all to hear this. Meet the Slash, the smallest blade ever created. Small but razor sharp, built to carry safely. Of this country, the territorial reach of this country, the military strength of this country got its roots in American slavery, the chattel slavery of black people, and then on that foundation, the ideology of white supremacy, of black inferiority, has was propagated. It was made a, a, a bedrock of one of the glues of this society, and it has been woven into this society ever since. The forms of oppression have changed. It took a civil war to end slavery, but then what happened? After not even 10 years of reconstruction, where black people were brought into some rights within this country, that was betrayed. The troops were pulled out, and black people were re-enslaved in new conditions, slavery by another name, sharecropping for generations. Surf-like conditions. And, and, let me, and let me explain that. Any black parent, any black adult, those of us in our 40s and 50s, our parents or our grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins of a particular age, sharecropping. My father, family sharecropping, sharecroppers. My mother, family sharecroppers. That's recent fucking history. My grandfather, my father's side of the family, had his land taken from him. Black folks had to leave the South until they were being terrorized. Blacks came up to the North, they bunched us up on top of each other. Frank. And it's we're black, we, we, we said we're going we're gonna to push it in. They brought drugs, weapons, and all kinds of vices in our community. So you get some motherfucker, and excuse my language, folks, it pisses me off, who just got here off the boat of the plane, or the star said, Why y'all talking about black people? You ain't that. Tell me what Indian person got pulled over while driving, while, 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 while in the Unless you, if you notice, they wear their hair a particular way. They ain't gonna cut their head off. They gonna wear certain clothes. They gonna make sure they sound a certain way. Look how the we keep talking about the great country is flag and the nationalism. You decide because it takes parents to a white audience. It is, we've been more 
picture that for anybody. Yeah, we the most disrespectful. When they did the common character. He did. He protested the most peaceful way that they found him for. What was all them immigrants coming in saying, I'm not American with this, but y'all try to let us not America. Let me finish playing the rest of this. Enforced through terror, lynch mob terror and violence. And the troops were pulled out to go and finish off the extermination of the native peoples. Okay? Then, another generation comes up in the face of changes in the U.S. economy and the need to pull black people out of the South and into the factories. Black people stood up and they waged struggle in the civil rights movement. They gave their lives. They stood up. White people stood with them. They went down from the North and stood with them. This upended Jim Crow. It was heroic. That Many did just unbelievably brave things. And then that was dismantled. And what did this system come back with? A new Jim Crow of mass incarceration that has ground up millions of black lives. So when I tell the story, this is science. When I tell the story of a black woman in Harlem with binoculars next to her window watching in terror every time her 12-year-old, 13-year-old son crosses the street because of what police do every day. Every day to black people. Every fucking day. When I talk about that, that is a particular that concentrates a huge reality that is defining to this country. And that's scientifically true. It's evidence-based. It's woven into the fabric of this society. It's culture, it's economics, and it's global reach. And so we can debate. If you want to argue that's not scientific, bring some evidence. Now, I would disagree a little bit. Everybody white did not fight in the civil rights. There were white folks that came to the North. There were whites from the North that do a damn thing. But I get her point. Right. And thank God there's some people like her that do exist. Yeah. But the thing is, this guy, brown skin, this guy who has more in common with us appearance culturally, he's basically saying, I don't want to hear about this. I don't want to know about black folk. I can give a rat ass about what's going on with black people. Because he's been he's benefited well, let me go fast and get this again. Melt fat like butter with this new powerful military invention. This si he's benefited from from living in this country. He's benefited from the struggles of black of black Americans. He doesn't care. He knows that he knows that there's going there's always going to be somebody who's willing to put let him get to the table before we do. He knows. So what he what he wants to do is create. Make it like, oh, the black community only people care is going through hell. Tell me where, where, where you see them going after the Indians the way they go after black folks. They don't go after no other, other so called black people. Say, what about the gays? They ain't the same thing. Right. They ain't the same. And, and, and I, want, I, want, I want people to understand something. We, as black Americans, need to understand that we have no allies. If we do, there's a very small group. But the ones that keep telling us that we are first races, we're whining, and we should be thankful. And a white folk loves saying, look at the immigrants. They, 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 they love this country, of course. They want to get next to y'all. They're not going to complain about the hypocrisy of America. But the thing is, when, when they get, they stop catching them. They stop quoting Dr. King and Dr. Mendes. All of a sudden, they stop putting them signs, coalition, this is why they take the church people coming in, twisted. All I say is because when you see say people cover, they don't want you to focus on the ethnicity of hand. They figure you hear people cover and blend us all together. All our vows ain't the same. Nobody vows the same as a black person. But my thing is, these South Asians, they think they better than us. They think they smarter than us. They think they can manipulate the system, but they but but they, when something happens to them, what do we do? We feel bad for them. We say they don't do that. But September never happened. All the so-called Middle Eastern people will catch the hell. All, it was it's hell from a large number of white folk. What do we do in the black community? We gonna pray with you. We gonna go to your church. We gonna stand by y'all. We see we shall overcome and all that other shit. I'm just shaking my head. God said said. Go to their stores and they still treat like we like we did some to them. You don't believe me? Go 
the store, be a nickel short. You got to put that back. When you go on the store, they don't need to look at you. Like you about to rob. Caucasian ones come in. How you doing? And that first part of the gun, they shot you. Oh, I cannot believe you feel me be a witness. No, nah, motherfucker. When black folks try to go in their communities, they say, ha, 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 ha. They ain't all up in our neighborhoods. Messing with our little boys, our little girls, our women, even some of our men. Now, I know everybody's not like that, and I want to make that clear. But the last, last decade, we really been got bold with it. Going on various talk shows, talking shit, and the news anchors ain't pushing back. But I guarantee you, they won't talk about no other group. They would not talk about another group. They everybody go to talk about the black person. They want to get in. Use our pain. Uh uh-uh, uh, we gotta start calling this shit out. And if cities again on election cycle, we need to start calling them. So you know what, Democrats, Republicans, or those of y'all claim to be our allies who keep using that term, people of color, stop failing y'all stuff with us. Got all y'all fucking up a fucking opportunities. All y'all do is sit back and, and pick our bones. Look what they did just in Chicago. They, 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 they made sure they got life without it. Blame her for shit that she had no control over, but had nothing to do with. And you get this handkerchief here, Brandon Johnson in, and they find 51 million for these immigrants. But when you have blacks come over here who may have been paying taxes, sacrificing, oh, we can't do nothing for y'all. But y'all help everybody else. Give them business loans, give them uh, 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 money to set them up. But us, just those of who have been here, those of us who are more American than a lot of these other people are, who actually have sacrificed, we told no. This is why we have to stop going out and talk to each other. This is why we got to learn how to agree with each other or, 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 or disagree with each other without being violent or petty. Because we got enemies around us. And I'm telling you right now, the South Asians and Asians, the Asians, they, 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 they still want to want that acceptance. But the South Asians, they want to go even harder than pay. That Vink and them, I mean, Nikki Hayden and Bobby Jim and the rest of them said all kinds of shit about us. We don't say nothing about them. We ain't get a damn big tone. And all in the media, the people act like afraid. And I hear these young brothers and sisters say correlation. Correlation of what? They won't. I'm going to stop it right here. Um, you know, in the first in the first video, in this um, Canada, that's terrible what the black people in Canada have to go through. And the solution was the second to the second man. They, this is what we have to do to get along. He's the only one that had a solution. But when you hear this, when you hear a video like this, um, it's not one particular group of people. It, it's just other groups of people are tagging on with with this mindset. And and the back of what he said, that's true. I remember in the Gulf War. Uh, I told a story about when I went away to this little school in Southeast Ohio and one time we went to a party at night and Sonny who was um, parents are from India um, almost got jumped by some white dudes in the Southwest Ohio and it was a couple black dudes and white dudes said Sonny ain't nobody gonna mess with you cause they want cause at that time they saw and he he was telling them, "Hey, I'm not I'm not from there, I'm not from." But they was going to jump on him because they thought during that time he, he's from over to where, where, um, where Saddam Hussein was from. He's Southeast Asian. Another time they get mad. I have seen them come at people who are the Sikhs from India with their religious garb that looks similar. To some Middle Eastern people, but they're, they're Sikhs. They're, in, they're from India. They're in America and Canada. They have been attacked in America, discriminated too. And um, I don't understand what the Southeast Asians, man. Why are you passing on the racism to somebody? Was some of the some of you pass on the racism to other people? And then the very people who some of us are black. 
will fight alongside of you. I don't I don't get that, man. I don't I don't get it. And even with these other groups of people, I don't understand that. Black people is the most kindest is those kindest, nicest people. We'll fight we we'll fight we'll fight against our own for other people. And go against our own. And I just don't understand this man. So that's the, the thing with the, with the division and the workplace and the polit and politics and it's and it's a, it's a, it's sad, man. And it's like I don't understand this. I really don't I, I understand. And then you have to understand the background. And I'm pretty sure Canada is the same way because I talked with the young woman. That she was kind of found out later on. She was kind of a nutball. But her parents was from New, and I told you a story about New Delhi, New Delhi, India. She was Southeast Asian too, and she told me about when she, when and stuff that happened to them up there in Vancouver, Canada, that they was going through some discrimination. You get from white now, who's mostly is is Southeast Asians and mostly South and whites. Guess guess who gave her the problem? The white people up there, because that's what she told me anyway. They discriminated against her father. But when I told you what you know, when I got, the, I had a paper I was about to give to, and her father came over and snatched it from me. Well, I thank you very much. Just real cold, white man. I don't understand. And, you know, so even though you try to be friendly to some people. Black people always try to, you know, we have. That's true. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm that kind of person too. It's like, wow, what, what the heck did I do? But it's just like, wow. And and I just don't understand. How can you go to a place around black people and have that kind of mindset around black people? How can you do that? You know, and knowing that you're going to encounter the same people. How can you, isn't that miserable being racist against somebody who you don't like because of the color of their skin and the texture of their hair and their features? Why you, do you, why would you go? I just, I've been trying to figure that out for the longest time. I don't care how much money. I, I would want to go around people I don't totally respect. I don't like them to be around them. I don't want to make money. And, and then I kind of idolize the people push the agenda of the people who my people are trying to be. The fair skinned, blonde hair, blue eye, Euro European looking people. I just don't I don't understand. I mean it's just that's crazy. Why do you want to come around people pe why do you come around people? And it's funny because some of the white people come around us that you look up to. And they, they, you know, and you don't think they're gonna suspect that's going on? I don't understand it, but yet, that's crazy, man. That's crazy, and uh, it's just sad that. And I, I got sense enough to know that everybody. I agree, but for the ones that are, are like that, why, why do you, why do you go to places where it's black? I mean, uh, got, you know, Africa, islands, that, and, and you, you have them over there. Then it's like, you about as dark as, the, dark as the people over there. I don't get that. I don't get it. And then you're going to be precious. Then, then the one time I seen, the, I had a video in one of my videos, and I, it was a Southeast Asian dude in, 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 on the continent of Africa. In Ghana, don't want somebody European and Asian on the continent of Africa. Don't want no employees from there. Don't want don't want no native employees. How how are you gonna go to the continent of Africa and, and discriminate or Caribbean islands? Why do you go hidden places? I've been trying to figure that out for the life of me. And you don't like people, some people who have, and I'm talking to the ones that got this problem with dark, dark and light skin and fair skin. Why do you go where the dark skinned people are at? Do you think that they're not going to discern that 
You go they, they pick up that you think that they're less than you. And then the very people some of the people you look up to don't think highly of you. They have like make they mock like you know what they refer to you? The women that wear the traditional red dot on they, oh, they call them the dot people. This is from white people told me this. Even though that's something traditional from marriage. And so yeah, you know that the one with the dot people. Those white people tell me stuff like this. Oh, you mean one of them dot people. So these same people who fair skinned, blonde hair, blue eyes, you look up to talking to you like talk about y'all like that. But you but you better than us? Look people that look like us with a different accent and different different same texture. Interesting. I don't get that. And I'm and like I said, again, it's not everybody, but it's the ones that have that and I seen over in India it's like wow. And even in the Caribbean island, try you know I, I wouldn't get a better job if we we scrub our skin. Like have a melanated skin, dark skin. If I, I, I could tell some Indian people, maybe you can pick up American a Bible. You find out in Revelation 12, the one that created everything in this earth, that some that the Christian community, don't, some Christians know this, that is Yeshua al-Mashiach, the one that raised the dead. And guess what? When you look in Revelation 12, and 12, it tells you his description. It tells you burnt brass and burnt bronze. When you take bronze, you take a penny to my Southeast Asians and other people. When you burn some, here's a penny. When you burn it, it turns burnt, burnt, a burnt penny, it turns black. This is in the Bible. This is the one, this is the one that raised the dead. This is the one that comes to every part of the world and you accept him. He's higher than any of the, 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 the so many of the religions over there and their gods and their messiahs. This is the truth. He's the only one that's going to come back. Cause none of, when you leave this world like any other human being, you're not going, you, none of those gods, you, you worship their statues and everything. It's not going to be there. This to my Southeast Asians. Read Revel get with a white Christian, he'll show you that. Or black Christian. Revelation 12. See, because that's the truth. See, 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 they don't like to show you that in the movie. You're going to find out what a dark, burnt, bronze brass is. Next, it's, it's, it's the next thing, the black. I'm just saying. And too bad some Christians don't want to show you, some, some Christian pastors don't want to show you this, but that's a fact, that's in the Bible. That's in every Bible in translation. King James and King James and but you don't, you can't, you don't like the people you see, but wait till you get to the other side one day when you leave this earth, who you can't, who you'll be able to see in the spirit. That's my message to, to, to them. Every person was treated just the same. We should get to know each other because of saying, not because of skin, not because of, of a totem pole level of white, white up here and, and black down there. What people, what, what individual wants to be around individuals like that? And why should you, why should any individual prosper you, you if you that kind of individuals like that? Just saying. All right, then, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoy this video. Share, like, and subscribe. You know, to next time, I hope you and I hope you learn something from this. And make and and that, and that the man had a solution. That's the only way we're gonna get along. You know, but if, if, if you practice racism, it's gonna cost you. He's absolutely right. And then you're not gonna progress. So keep being racist. Keep being biased towards other people. Because what you don't understand is 
money goes and currency goes all through the hands of, of mankind. So someone expose you and you see how the way the world is companies big companies small companies are folding up under so it's something to think about when you when you're racist not only is going people get hurt at your company but it's going to cost you money so just keep being biased think about it so next time you guys be blessed and hopeless let's just get to somebody change your change your mind change your thoughts take care